Hey guys, welcome back to another fun episode of the Fun Investors. We are glad to have you here today. I hope you're still keeping safe. Today we are going to be handling a very, very fun topic, how to financially prepare for a child. Yeah, as we all know, at some point, you will have a child in your life. If God has blessed you and you're able to get a child, and also there are people who decide to also adopt, or you can be given a responsibility to take care of your niece and nephews. So yeah, basically we are going to like uh, help you know how to financially prepare for all this. Children can be very, very expensive if you don't plan, but also if you plan, it can be manageable. So the key is how financial, financially are you prepared to have this child or to take care of these uh, children? So today, we are going to be taking you through some of the points on how to financially prepare for this. On to my first point, health insurance. Health insurance is very key when you're preparing for a child or if you have a child, you're responsible for. For example, let's say you, you've gotten a baby and uh, let's say you've probably conceived and you don't know where to start. Maybe you can start by focus, focusing on your health cover. Do you have a medical cover with any of the insurance companies? And what are the limits on maternity? What are the limits on post-hospitalization? If let's say you deliver and you have a complication after birth, those are things you need to put into consideration. There are also the people who are not able to afford a medical cover. And maybe this is the time you can take, a, take a advantage of your NHIF. NHIF, you can pay as little as 500 or you just pay 6,000 for the entire year. And the hospitals that allow you to deliver with just your NHIF card. So if you're not able to afford the corporate medical cover, you can go the NHIF way. Either way, financially prepare by getting a health insurance if you're going to have a baby. And this is going to help you because you don't have to pay cash during delivery. It can be very, very costly depending on the hospital you are in. But uh, when you're prepared and you have these covers running, either in HIF or an health insurance cover, you are sure at least you won't have that headache when you're getting yeah. your baby. So it's really, really important to have health insurance in any way as you prepare for this child. Yeah, that is on the way. Let me ask you guys, what if um, you're not working and you happen to have an oops baby? Okay, yes, you're not under 18, but say you are working, you're maybe in the hotel industry, you lost your job, so insurance is no longer covering you at that time. So what do you guys think or suggest we should do or you could do during a time like that? Because like I would think um, you can draft a pre-baby budget. So this is assuming that A, you are working, you had health insurance, maybe you were a month in, then you lost your job. So you'd already started planning for your pre-baby budget. Uh, the other option was maybe you lost your job before you got pregnant, so you were not covered at all. You hadn't even thought of it, and now the baby comes. But I think either way, either scenario, it's really important to have a pre-baby budget because you know the thing is when babies come, that that whole uh, shabang where you had your own, uh, you know, I buy coffee for myself, I buy milk for myself, I can panga my bottle of water for two weeks. When the baby comes, that bottle of water will get finished in two seconds. So some of these things need to be planned and having a pre-baby budget will really assist in this. But what do you guys think? Like, do you think we should go out and get insurance if you don't have a job? Or do you think it's better to plan and just save money pole pole? What do you guys think? Uh, yeah, Kenna, that's a really good point. And um, it's a good question as well. I think what I would add to that is the importance of having an emergency fund. Uh, this becomes an emergency. So if you have an emergency fund in your normal budget, then this is where you would use it. Of course, it would cause you to quickly deplete your fund because you hadn't planned for it because it's an emergency. And oops, but uh, this is where an emergency fund really, really takes, uh, you know, center place. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, let's hear from some of the other mothers and father. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, what Makena is saying Okay, for example, probably you're not working or you have really low source of uh, income. Maybe this is where the NHIF that I was mentioning comes in. Like you can literally contribute the 500 shillings towards your NHIF so that at least you have a health insurance for your child, the child you're expecting, or uh, even delivery. Yeah, basically, the, the NHIF is, should be more affordable at least for low yeah. income. Uh, and as, yeah. yeah, so true. Yeah, I think... 
Uh -huh. or uh, you can actually cut on your budget and yeah. uh, and uh, do away with what you really don't need, but uh, stay stay afloat with what you exactly need and save that money for this upcoming baby, the oops baby, whether you're the father or whether you're the mother, because you really yeah. need to take responsibility for the, for the life that you're bringing into the world. You can uh, start saving little by little for that child once you realize that the baby, the baby is coming or even in, in a situation where you can't save, as I said, use emergency fund or even cut back on your expenses. If you need to, um, to move to a smaller house in the meantime, you can do that. If you need to figure out on how to, as a lady, uh, the expenses that the ladies normally have of makeup and uh, hair, you can cut that budget. As a father, if you're one who spends money of, on one, two, three things that are luxury, you can cut on them and put that money aside for the baby. Yeah, very true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, Ken, I, was, I think I was just going to add one more point. So yes, you're cutting back on your expenditure. Yes, you're transferring your risk to MHAF. Uh, yes, you have an emergency fund. Um, I would also say increase your income. So you want to get a side hustle, you know, you want to get something, something that will help you increase your income so that even as you're controlling the outflows, you're also increasing your income because, you know, this being the emergency, you're now having to think on your feet, everything goes, whatever you can do, do it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And just to finish off on that point, um, there are certain things that in, based on your view of what a budget is and your view of what is expensive and not expensive, I would say, we would just suggest that it's good to think, um, be humble with your ideas. Like if you want a stroller, instead of getting a stroller, I mean, uh, do you, if you live in an apartment on the sixth floor, do you really need a stroller? Like you can actually carry the baby and have like a nanny and pay half that price of the stroller. Uh, if you wanted, say, a car seat and you don't have a car, do you really need a car seat just because everyone is saying get a car seat? So some of those things are part of the things you put in your budget. Like, just be realistic. Like, if you were to be put in the middle of a village somewhere, would you need half of these things you're buying? You just need the basics, food, clothes, shelter, maybe diapers or nappies. Just be basic if you don't have a job. But if you have a job, you're able to plan a bit better, have some of the few luxuries that you'd want. If you have a car, you can get those car seats. But just be realistic with where you are. So I think also another thing that's really important is to get um, a pediatrician. Uh, it's not just about getting any pediatrician. For example, if you have a health insurance, it's good to ask the people in your office who have already gotten kids, maybe in the past one or two years, who they use as their pediatrician, and then check and see if that baby is still in the, if the pediatrician is still in the list. So for example, um, if you just give birth today and the someone who gave birth last year, chances are the pediatrician is still the same one. You can both use the same one. And if the reviews are good, by all means, use that person. Because what happens is when you've given birth, most of the time you'll find that the pediatrician at the hospital, the first pediatrician who sees your baby, is really the one in your insurance list. So instead of being left, um, having this doctor, then being left, uh, having a, a void where you don't know who to go to next or what to do, and having that stress of having to think, okay, no, where do I go, where do I go? It's always good to just prepare ahead. Once you've uh, finished with this first doc pediatrician, now you can go for your second, third visit to the one that you've been referred to. It just gives you peace of mind and it makes it easier for you to go to this person. Alternatively, if you're not working, it's still good to ask friends who, which pediatrician they go to. Then from there, have from that planning of your budget, make sure you have enough money because a pediatrician goes anywhere from 2,000 to 4,000 shillings, depending on where you're going, just for consultation. So you haven't paid for your vaccinations, you haven't paid for whatever other illnesses that might occur, you haven't paid for, you know, all these small, small two things, you, your, your testing, I don't know, the pressure, you haven't paid for those things yet. So have cash at hand, always make sure you have that. And just as um, was mentioned earlier, have an NHF card ready because the NHF card sorts you out, like half of those bills are sorted out. So it's really important. So I don't know, would anyone else uh, have a different experience? Maybe yeah. yeah, maybe what I would add before we finish that point, McKenna. Yeah. Uh, for example, like uh, for the NHIF, it's important even for those who have corporate covers because when you're in the hospital, even when you're being discharged, there will be a portion that will, the NHIF is the one that is supposed to pay. Failure to which you'll have to pay cash. Whether you have a proper health insurance or not, there's normally that portion for NHIF that NHIF has to come in for the bed, 
and uh, yeah, mostly it's for the bed. So whether you have a corporate cover, medical cover or not, you still must have an NHIF cover as a person, yeah. Yeah, so true. Very true. I think on my end, I'll, I'll add on to the point that you've already shared on the post baby expenses that you need to prepare for. One of them is if you have an insurance cover, and we are basically talking about the insurance for those who have, you have to figure out and talk to your insurer or your health provider uh, to know at what point you need to add your baby to the cover. Because uh, after the baby is delivered up to a certain number of days, they are going to use your cover as the mother or as a father. Then after a point, at, at some point, they'll need to have their own insurance cover or rather they need to be added into your own insurance. So find out from uh, your health provider or your insurer at what point you need to add that baby to your cover so that they are covered independently because of the vaccines that are going to come along or even illnesses here and there because babies catch fevers and colds here and there at, at, different, at different rates. So it's good to be safe and, uh, and plan ahead on how you're going to add your baby into the cover. Another thing you need to consider post baby, but you do it pre baby, is uh, getting help for for the pass for the additional member of the family that is coming on board. So you need to uh, look for nannies, interview a few here and there, if you're able to pay one, or if in case you're not able to pay one, you can as well talk to a family member, uh, a sister, or even a niece who can come in and help you, because you will realize once a baby comes, it might be overwhelmed as the father or even as the mother taking care of that baby, having sleepless nights and you're thinking and figuring out how you're going to do your laundry or do house chores or even cook for yourself or even for your, your, the people in the house. So it's important that you figure out how you're going to get help for you to be able to have sanity for that period the baby is coming into your life. Yeah. I think also another realistic thing to remember is as much as we're getting this help and these nannies or sisters or brothers, uh, I think each of us have all gone through our own experiences where we've had over five house helps, our sisters and brothers came and went, and then you're there like, eh, so, so now me, you know, so I think we also need to think ahead and just imagine in case of should these people go, there's someone within your environment who you know, at, at the very worst, if I have to go out, I can leave them maybe at the neighbors because you trust the neighbor. Or if you have your mom or dad with you, you can leave them at your parents' place. If you have a sister or brother who can, who's older or more responsible, you can leave them there as you figure out how to look for nannies because this, <laughs> they, can, they can shock you. Yes, they can tell you they're here and gone tomorrow and you'll be like, wow. Yeah, so just, and also have a good relationship with your employer if you're employed because when your house help leaves and you're leaving in the morning, muna toka pamoja, hash is gone, you you are there like sasa difanye, and you have a meeting at nine o'clock. It's very good to have a boss who also is able to understand that you're not just playing games, that this, some of these things happen and that he can give you that day to go figure yourself out, look after the kid as you look for someone to drop off the kid. So, so those are some of the things that I think also as you plan, you also have them in mind also. Yeah. Yeah, and on to the nanny's point, Esther. Yes, 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 yes Bri. <laughs> on to the nanny's point, it's also important to note that uh, don't pay your nanny what you cannot afford, because we are talking about finances here. Like, don't go with the flow that people are paying this much, I also need to pay this much. Yeah. Just pay what you can afford. It's all about an agreement with your nanny, and if they are comfortable with that amount, just pay them that, and also have a very good relationship with them if you're paying them less just make sure they are comfortable you buy for them the toiletries the things that they need personally so that at, the, at least they're able to stay also because it trickles back to being an employer at that moment because if you're a bad employer your child will not, will not be taken care of properly so make sure you're a very very good employer to your nanny and make sure you get the right one make sure you interview your nanny make sure you have all the details for your nanny because you need to know the background of this person and the person recommending should be someone you really know well, because I always believe in uh, nannies that are recommended by people I know, at least from my experience, and that has always worked for me. So make sure you only pay what you can afford. And if you can't afford a nanny, because we all know not everyone can afford a nanny. If you can't afford a nanny, 
get a relative who is really, really good. Because not all of them are going to take care of your baby wholeheartedly. They'll be like, Sasa umenyandika. So you have to get someone who is really willing to be with you and your child and support you if you're not yeah. able to afford a nanny. And then on, a, on, a, on the flip side, make sure at least this relative, if probably they have a need, help them take care of their needs. If maybe you can take them to school at some point in their lives, please do. But at least if you're not able to afford at that moment, do not go that direction. Just get someone who can help you so that you don't have to spend on that and focus on the basic needs. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Yeah. Uh, great, great conversation so far. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Continue. Yeah. And, and it's important to point out that this, this sounds a lot like, uh, you know, um, content tailored for uh, people raising children here in Africa. But should you be outside Africa, you want to consider, uh, you know, child, child care facilities. I think there's some nurseries or uh, what, what would you call them, McKenna? Thank um, you. Daycare. That's a, yeah. That's what I was looking for. I was like childcare. <laughs> daycare. Daycare facilities. Yeah. So those are some of the things you want to financially plan around, uh, where you're not able to get a nanny because getting a nanny is very expensive. So yes, there are daycare facilities in in such countries. So the other thing you want to think about is adjusting your beneficiaries. You now have this child in your life. So what do you do? Uh, you've been having all of these uh, investments. You have. Um, you know, let's say shares in the stock market, let's say you have bonds, you've invested in different things, unit trusts, you have a, a house somewhere, you now have land somewhere, and all of these things were there maybe before the child came into the picture. So now you have your children and it's important for them to know that they can financially benefit in the event of any demise of a parent. And so what happens is you want to either capture that in a will, so you could capture that in your will or um, you could capture that as well uh, in each of the policies. If you have a life policy, you want to go and adjust the beneficiary there and capture that. So this could be a child uh, of your own, or this is, you know, when you adopt a child, as uh, Brenda had said earlier, or, you know, just the different situations that would present themselves. And now you find yourself as a guardian, and this is someone under your care, and you would want them to be a beneficiary in the event that you're no longer here. So it's important for you to adjust your beneficiaries so that it, pro it uh, uh, protects uh, protect their interests uh, in the investments that you have. I think the other thing you want to think about is um, to keep funding your retirement. I think uh, we are big advocates for retirement here. <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, keep funding your retirement because yes, the child is here, but that doesn't mean that your life has stopped. So you need to keep thinking long term. Think about life beyond uh, their, their campus days. When your child grows up, they have gone through high school, through campus, they now have a life of their own. So who's going to sustain you when, they're, when you're that old? Are they the ones who are now going to come and take care of your bills? I don't think that's proper because now that becomes that whole generational tag and what we call black tax where the younger children are now having to take care of their parents. And we'd want to break the cycle. So it's important for you to begin to think, think long term fund your retirement, put aside money uh, to take care of you in the, in the golden ages. And um, yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's yeah. what I would add. I don't know if anyone else wants to chip in there, but uh, if not, uh, Mugambi, yeah, Mugambi, yeah, yeah, Mugambi, you'd want to add something. Give us a man's perspective, what would you <laughs> advise? Yeah. Maybe to add something on what Tester said, uh, basically when also you, you're considering adding the child as a beneficiary in your covers and everything else, you also want to consider the fact that sometimes these children are minors and you need really somebody who can be able to take care of them, uh, of them if you're not there. So what you basically do, you appoint somebody as a guardian. They don't have to have any percentage among us the, your asset allocation, but it, this is somebody who can be able to take care of this child when you're not there. So basically, as you put them as minor, also appoint a guardian, somebody you can really trust. Could be your brother, could be your mother, could be your wife, because we all have different uh, types of people that we can trust with our assets, especially when it comes to our children and we are not there. Sometimes um, that is something that we forget, but it is very important to consider that. And uh, another point that you need to consider in this particular case, when you're preparing financially for a child, you need to look at the future of these children in terms of their education. 
you'd want to save a little in a bank account separate from what you normally assess every other day so that when this child uh, gets to a, an age of going to school, you don't have to struggle. You don't keep wondering where do I get money for these children to, uh, to study. So basically save highly uh, to, to avoid uh, the last minute rush whereby you're wondering how can you be able to raise school fees. Then also you need to look at the post-delivery budget. Remember when the child comes, there, there is also a probability that the expenses will increase. Have you done your budgets well so that in the event you have this child, how will you be able to cater for their clothes, their food, the nanny and the like? And also remember you may want to move to a bigger house. Have you factored this in, in your budgets? Because at the end of the day, you'll have to cater for each and every expense that comes with this child. So basically plan early, because if you don't plan early, you'll be caught up in a fix that you may not be able to get yourself out of. So basically, yeah, those are my points. Yeah, I think it's also good to acknowledge that there's some people who've probably already, um, you know, they didn't know some of these things. Maybe the kid is already on the way or the kid has come and they're they feel that maybe they're in debt, they're financially struggling, they're just wondering how will I even do any of these things you're suggesting. And I think sometimes it's okay to acknowledge that you're struggling, to take a step back, first figure out, you know, the basics. How am I going to pay off this debt? So you get a, a something to do. And then after that, you find a way to, maybe you can't afford to move into a bigger house, maybe you can't afford to even have a house. Move it. You can, it, it's okay to go back to the village or move in with a family member until you're able to get your footing. So don't look at it as this is the only way in which you should prepare for the baby. There's so many different scenarios and different, each of us have had to go through different experiences to get to this point, but yeah. it's good to understand that just start where you are. If you already have a million in debt, it's okay. Imagine as long as you're not being thrown out by the bank and if, if you are, uh, just tell them to give you a bit of time. But until that time comes, just one step at a time. Ask family members for help. If they can, if some family member can help you pay for the diapers, another one can help you pay for the food, another one can help you pay for the vaccinations. That gives you a bit of time to go to the market and sell tomatoes and onions or whatever you need to sell to offset this loan, pole pole. So don't, don't look at it as, oh my God, it's the end. If I don't follow this, I'm done. Just get a good support system, support network, and if you're employed, cut back. Just cut back. If your friends are still in this phase of when the Java, when the Sijuapi, you just go to the Kibanda over there, eat your food. It's okay. You're still alive. You're fine. You're full. Move on. Like you don't have to do the same things everybody else is doing. Just remember, this child is the most important thing in your life at that time. You need to figure yourself out and get out of the rut, and then find your way. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's important because you realize that uh, getting a baby, sometimes it doesn't uh, dictate the age. Some people get babies at a very early stage in their lives. Like you find maybe they're still in school, they're still in college. It's okay. Babies are still a blessing at the end of the day. What you do, the way McKenna is saying, get a support system. If you have to take the baby to your mom, if you still have your mom, take the baby to your mom or your big sister. Let them stay with your baby, at least as you figure out your life. But it all trickles down to having a very, very strong support system. So as we wrap this up, it's all, it's all about awareness. It's all about planning. It's all about budgeting. It's all about getting to know what really do you need to know financially before you get this child or you take care of this child. So we just want to thank you for tuning in with us and going through the conversation with us until the end. And yeah. just to remind you, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, kindly please do subscribe. Let us grow together. Comment down below with some of the things that uh, maybe we left out. Yeah, please comment, like, and also hit that notification bell because as we upload a video, you'll be the first to know that a video is up on our channel. And that normally happens on Thursday. So thank you so much for tuning in and have a lovely day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.